rid of that, get rid of that. There we go. Uh, now, I'm going to begin some messages on the subject of revival. Uh, don't preach on revival a lot, you know, and a lot of churches don't. And some churches, that's about all they ever preach on is revival. So uh, I'm going to have several messages on the subject of revival. We're going to go into it pretty detailed. Uh, so I want you to follow along in your Bible. I don't know why I forgot when I got home. Uh, my, uh, my granddaughters, my two granddaughters that live with me, they had four other girls there. And uh, they, they warned me about that. And they said uh, something about having some girls up there. And I said, well, that's all right. I'll just be gone all day then. I don't have to worry about it. Well, little did I know that they didn't come until after I got back home. And there they were, and they stayed all night. And so uh, I went back to my bedroom early and read, you know, Brother Larry Baker sent me a book, a really good book, and I was reading it and sat there in my bed and, and uh, read that book, about three or four chapters of that. And uh, so I forgot I was going to put these scriptures on the slides because I have so many of them. But we're going to talk about revival, lesson one. And I'm going to entitle this one, Our Concern. Our Concern. Don't forget that title. Because, uh, Colin, I'll be asking you what I preached on this morning. All right, revival. Our concern. Revival uh, is hardly ever on our minds. That is, as far as the subject, it's hardly ever on our minds. We either ignore uh, the subject as far as its importance is concerned, or we think on a daily basis that it was uh, has no meaning in our own lives. Like, I'm already where I am, and I'm already where I should be, and I don't really need revival. Uh, and this is why revival needs to be preached on. And, and I do occasionally. Uh, we need to be reminded from time to time to be revived. Because if we're not, sometimes we just forget that, you know, all that I do, all that I am, all that I read, do I need to be revived? Well, sometimes, yes, we do. Uh, the nonchalant attitude, the I'm not concerned or I don't care attitude sometimes will creep into our lives. And we don't mean for that to happen, but it just does. And we sort of slip into it without it ever expecting it to come. We, it, just, it just comes. We try to do what's necessary to be a good Christian. I think everybody who's a believer here tries to do that. Um, but we just somehow lose our power with God. Uh, because we slide back from our first love. Remember that story over in the book of Revelation, how that church lost their first love. And that church lost their first love because individual people in the church lost their first love, you see. And uh, we, we sort of, like uh, one of the minor prophets says, we are at ease in Zion. We, we peacefully recline into sort of a nonchalant attitude and position. One little movement at a time, just one little movement at a time, we step back and sort of half baby steps you know, going backward from our service uh, to the Lord. And then all of a sudden, how did we get here? It's so easy. It's so natural. It's so human. If we're not reminded about revival, we won't ever think about revival. We lose sight of the real goal of being a believer in Jesus Christ. We allow the work of God to go uh, sort of into a free fall without any intention of ever destroying it or, or doing any damage to it, uh, yet we slip back from it. So with this in mind, we're going to bring a few messages on our concern or on revival and this first one on our concern. In that verse I asked you to look up, uh, there are, uh, Paul reminded Timothy, he said you need to remember some things. Look at verse 5 there in 2 Timothy 1, 5. It says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. Remember. Now this, everything I say is not going to fit everybody. I'm sure there, there's probably at least one person here today that's completely revived. You don't need any revival. I mean, you're there. You know, you're right there where you're supposed to be. But I say about 99, 4,400% of us, we need to step up a little bit. We need to get a little closer. We need to do, you know, do it a little bit more. But you know, this won't fit everybody either, but do you, do you remember how that your mom and your dad and your grandma and your grandpa, if you're fortunate enough to know them, I knew only one of my grandparents was my, father, my mother's father. And uh, he talked about religion and stuff uh, other times. I never heard him talk about it. He was a very sick man when I uh, remember him. 
Uh, but remember your mom and your dad. Remember how they instilled in you the things of the Word of God. How they told you that the Word of God is the truth. How that they brought you up in the in a, a sort of the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Took you to church and, and taught you the things of the Lord. I've told you the story about my dad. And his favorite question to people was, when are you going to join the church? That was his way of witnessing to people. Now you have to be from Kentucky to know this, but he didn't mean what he said. Now, it wasn't that he was lying to anybody, but it was an expression that was used, like we would say, are you saved? Do you know the Lord as your personal Savior? Because everybody knew that you don't join a church until you know the Lord. You know, everybody already knew that. So his favorite expression was, when are you going to join the... He asked me that one time. And I knew he wasn't talking about joining the church to be saved. I, I just knew, I knew he meant, when are you going to be saved? And when you're saved, you're going to join the church. That's what he meant. And, and so uh, I remember my father talking like that. I remember my mom going around uh, in the house singing uh, in the garden and uh, where we'll never grow old and... You know, all those old favorite hymns that we love to sing, she just went around, all, and I'll never forget that. I, I remember my dad used to tell her, why don't you just shut up for a little while? And she'd shut up for about four minutes, and then she'd start singing again. She just couldn't help it, you know, because she loved the Lord and she loved those great hymns. So we need to remember, remember the people who have influenced you. Somebody influenced you. Somebody came into your life. Somebody told you something. Somebody talked to you. Somebody introduced you to a Bible. I was talking to a gentleman the other day and he was telling me how that, that uh, some young man that, that he had talked to or something had never seen a Bible as far as opening one and looking at it. Had never, in America, had never seen a Bible close enough to open it up and look at a word in the Bible. That's where we are in America today. We need revival. We, we need to, to let people know that we believe the Bible. We need to maybe pick up some Gospel of John's and hand them out to people. I remember there was a man years ago, an evangelist, his name was Ewing, and he went up to Canada, and he, he was an evangelist up there, and he went around uh, passing out the Word of God. That's all he was doing, passing out Gospels of Rome. And one, one of the big churches up there went around and collected them back up because he did, they didn't want the people to know anything about the Bible. They wanted the people to know more about the church than the Bible. And he just kept on handing them out. And, kept, and you know what? People would read that, and they'd trust the Lord. You know, you don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a preacher or a pastor to be a, a, an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Give a Bible. Give a track. Also, we have to remember that we once were faithful to the Lord, especially when our hearts were broken. Remember uh, when your heart was broken over sin? Remember when you trusted the Lord, how, how deep you were in despair when the Lord came and regenerated your heart? And, and when He gave us grace... Uh, and uh, through grace gave us faith to believe and trust in Him as, as our personal Savior. In Hebrews 10.32 it says, But call to remembrance the former days, in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of affliction. To be illuminated means your mind is open to something. Something that you maybe hadn't comprehended before or hadn't thought of before. And you know, that's the way it is with the Gospel many times. I was, I was reading a, a, an email, or rather a Facebook post uh, this week. I, I think it was yesterday. This guy said, the first time in all these years I've been going door to door witnessing, he said, a man threatened my life. And he said, if you ever come back to my door again, I'll blow your head off. Yeah. Don't tell me it's not a battle. It's a fight of affliction, isn't it? Certainly it is. I don't know who that was, and he probably wouldn't do it, but nonetheless, he tried to scare the guy to death, and he must have. Because he actually pasted, uh, you know, posted it on Facebook. People post anything on Facebook. They'll just put anything on there. Absolutely anything. But that's a, that's a sermon for another day, so we're not going to talk about that now. We also must remember, as stated in 1 Peter 2.10, if you want to jot that reference down, 1 Peter 2.10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. You used to not be saved. You used to not be God's child. You know, we have these people going around saying everybody's a child of God. No, everybody is not a child of God. You're not a child of God until you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust Him as your personal Savior and then you're adopted into His family by the blood of Jesus Christ and by faith in His blood and in His work on Calvary. It goes on to say, which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. You know, we as Christians, we're a blessed people. We're a fortunate people. I mean, we were lost and going to hell and God saved us. 
We come to church sometimes, we're nonchalant, and we think, oh, well, I'll go there, and I'll get home, and I'll do what I'm supposed to do on Sunday, and that's just about it, you know. And I'm not, I'm not accusing, and, I, and I'm not threatening, and I'm not trying to be negative, because, you know, we're all like that sometimes. But I'm just saying, where are we? And so I want to give you a few points this morning. I want you to jot them down if you have something to jot them down on. I want to talk about our concern. I'm going to talk about a nonsense concern. Nonsense concern. You know what nonsense is? You know, the kids are playing around, jumping up and down, breaking things, and you'll say, that's a bunch of nonsense. Stop that nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. Well, let me give you an illustration. I'll just tell this quickly. I've got a whole bunch of things here to say about it, but I'm not going to have time to tell you all these things. But, but you remember the, the man called Jonah? We all know Jonah, don't we? I'd like to know what Jonah looks like. Maybe I'll see him one of these days and... And uh, he's probably a little guy about this tall, shorter. You know, I always picture people shorter than I am. I told you an old lady came here one time, visited. One time, as far as I know, maybe that's the reason she didn't come back. I don't know. But I think she came to a singing or something we had. And she walked out the door there, and she was about this tall to me. And I'd never met her in my life. And I shook her hand. I said, I just love you. And she said, I said, because you're shorter than I am. I said, I love everybody who's a little shorter than I am. And she was a whole lot shorter than me. And uh, so I just loved her death. You know, Jonah, I just sort of look at him like a little short man. Maybe he wasn't. But you know, God called him to go to, to a wicked nation called, a uh, wicked city called Nineveh. Uh, and uh, he didn't want to go because he hated those people. And so God, now if you'd been here Wednesday night or two ago, you'd have heard all this whole story. And so uh, he called him to go and he didn't want to go. So he went, uh, he was on his way to Tarshish. And uh, God had the men to throw him out of the ship. He went down in the water. And uh, a fish swallowed him up. And he was down there in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And when he came back out, God said, Okay, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. He said, Okay. <laughs> uh, because God had just sent him through uh, a little discipline to where he would, next time God asked him, he would actually say yes. So he went to Nineveh. And he actually preached repentance to Nineveh. And that whole city repented and turned to God and said, we're not going to do these bad things anymore. We, we repent. We're turning away from them. But then Jonah got mad. Got mad at God because God forgave them. And God, and they repented and God didn't destroy the nation or the city. And so he went out and closed the book by being mad at God. That's nonsense. That's a nonsense concern. Jonah had no concern for those people. God, he didn't have a heart for those people. He didn't want those people to be saved. All he wanted was for them to be destroyed. Now, again, let me, let me just carry the, the message a little farther than I did when we were going through the book. Less than a hundred years later, those same people had turned away from that repentance and had gone so far into sin that God sent the Chaldeans to come and destroy the whole place. And it was gone for many years. Scholars didn't even know whether there was a place called Nineveh until they dug up some things that proved that there was and that the Bible was true. Aren't you glad when somebody finds, I mean, not that we need it, but aren't you glad when somebody finds something and says, hey, you know, the Bible might just be true. Because it is, right? That's nonsense. And if you have no concern about the lost, if you have no concern about people being saved, you have a nonsense concern in, in the kingdom of God. We need to have a concern for people and we'll deal with that. In, in a, another point in a minute or two. The second thing is the normal concern. The normal concern. That's sort of like the concern that most of us have. Just a normal, everyday, you know, concern. They think they've been serving the Lord for many years and it's about time for the young people to take it, to take it over and do their part. Now, I want to remind you that there's nowhere in the Bible where it says anything like that. There's nowhere in the Bible that says when you get old, you give up and let all the young people do it. Because number one, in your old age, if you don't teach them how to do it, they're not going to know how to do it anyway. And you're supposed to teach them and be an example to them until you die or until you can't just can't do it anymore. You know? And uh, But I want to remind you of a, uh, of a couple of things. First of all, I want to remind you that Moses was 80 years old when he went into Egypt to deliver them, uh, deliver Israel from Egypt. Now, I'm like Brother... Ashcraft. I'll be 80 years old in 10 years. So I'm not 80 years old yet. I might be so decrepit when I'm 80 years old I won't be able to get out of bed. I don't know. I don't know how old 80 years old is. I've seen people 80 years old, but I don't, I, I mean, personally, I don't know. But Moses, 
just started his main ministry. His brother Aaron that went with him was 83 years old. Did you know that Noah was 600 years old when he started building the ark? Anybody here that old? I don't think so. Some of you look that old, but I don't think there's anybody here quite that old. Do you know that Daniel served the Lord for over 70 years? Over 70 years, and I'm not, I'm not, even, I'm not even 70 yet. By the way, our high school class that graduated together, we're all going to get together on the 16th of August, and we're going to celebrate our 70th birthdays. Isn't that wonderful? That's weird to me, but I'm going to be there. I have to be there, they say, because I have to take the group picture. Um, but And I'm going to name it something real silly. But nonetheless, Paul, an apostle, served the Lord until he was an aged man. Listen to me as I read to you Philemon 1, verse 9. <coughs> It says, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I don't know how old Paul was, but the Bible says he was an aged man. And where was Paul? He was in prison for serving the Lord Jesus Christ as an aged man. And so, there is not a smidgen of evidence in the scriptures that teach us that you can get too old to serve the Lord. Now you might be too old to go door to door in visitation. You might be too old to repair things around uh, the building. I want you to know that Brother Darrell just fixed a piece on the wall over here. You can't even tell it was broken. Some of you didn't even know it was broken probably. But there was a little big old space over there. Every time I'd look over there I'd see it. And then he went over there and put his finger in it and made a great big old hole. I said, oh my goodness, you broke the whole building. But look at there, you can't even tell, can you? Maybe you can't do that stuff. Maybe you can't climb up on a 12 or whatever, 15 feet, whatever this is, and put a bulb in or clean something or, or paint the ceiling or do whatever. Maybe you can't do that. Maybe you can't sweep floors and polish furniture. But you're not too old to serve the Lord. Psalm 92, 14 says, they shall, now you'll love this. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. But listen, they shall be fat and flourishing. <laughs> now let me remind you that the word fat in the Bible doesn't have the same connotation that it does today. In the Bible, if you were fat, that meant you were, you were vital, you were alive. That meant you meant something. You can contribute to society. You could, you know, you could do things. Or that there was great fruit from your, from your work. So they shall be fat and flourishing. When? When you're in your old age. Notice the righteous are called palm trees and cedar trees in Psalm 92 and 12. Paul told Titus and uh, the aged, he said the aged men, in Titus it says the aged men, be sober, brave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. In other words, be an example. Old people can be an example to the young people. And sometimes they're not, and that's one of the problems. The aged women, in the next verse in Titus 2, says, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Women, he says, teach other women. Teach the young women how to act and, and how, uh, how to act in their marriage and what kind of a marriage to have and, and talk to them and be friends to them and pray with them and so on. And uh, so, in our normal concern, we still want to see people trust the Lord. We still want to have a wonderful, inspiring church service. We still love the hymns, and we love to sing them. And we still dedicate ourselves to regular church attendance and giving. But we stop growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one thing to grow in knowledge. That's just to learn stuff. And you can do that. You can do that sitting in church or reading your Bible at home. But it's quite another to grow in grace. But to grow, you have to desire, the Bible says, the sincere milk of the Word. You know what the sincere milk of the Word is? That's like a little baby drinking milk. And I understand that this word sincere is the strongest Greek word that can be used for being sincere or concerned about something. And here's how you read your Bible. Don't worry about the parts you can't understand. Just don't worry about them. Because there's a ton of stuff in there you can understand. I mean tons and tons and tons that you can understand. So I tell people, you read the Bible till you understand something and you stop and think about it and look at it, maybe read it again, write it down, maybe even memorize it if you want to. You know, Now that's growing in knowledge. 
But you know, it's also growing in grace because the more of the Word of God we put in us, the more of the Word of God comes out from us. And uh, Hebrews 6 once says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Just knowing the Lord, knowing about the Lord, having a lot of knowledge of the Bible is not enough. We need to go on to perfection. Grow in grace. This normal concern isn't enough. Philippians 3.14 says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I keep looking, what does God want me to do tomorrow? How does he want me to stretch forward? We're, like, we're, we're training for an Olympics in a way. You see, we want to do the best we can. We want to be in the best spiritual condition that we can. Some of the people who are in the worst physical condition are in the best spiritual condition. Did you know that? Some of the people who can't even come to our church are, are, are more faithful to the Lord in the sense that many of us who come all the time. It's because they, they, they trust the Scriptures and they pray to the Lord and they're concerned about people and on and on it goes. So he says, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. Philippians 3.13 says, Brethren, I, can, I count not myself to have apprehended. If you think I've arrived, it's wrong. You haven't arrived. You're not as good as you think you are. You're not as smart as you think you are. You're not as full of grace as you think you are. We've not arrived. We still have to go forward. Press toward the mark of the high calling of God. And forget those things which are behind and reach forward to those things that are before. And then we have a no-nonsense concern. A no-nonsense concern. There's no nonsense in this. Many of you know this by heart. Romans 10, 1. Brethren, now listen carefully. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That's a no-nonsense concern. I want to see people saved. I really do. And, and I want the Lord to grow that desire, that concern. For people. There's no nonsense in Romans 9 3 where it says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. If I could, he said, I, I would even give myself that my nation might be saved, that the people of my nation might know the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no nonsense in Luke 15 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Even heaven gets rejoiced and rejoices when uh, people are saved. Aren't you glad for that? Sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's just, oh, well, that was good. You know, oh, oh I'm glad for that. Oh, yeah, yeah, one more person baptized, one more member of the church. Well, y'all just, no, 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 no. We should be excited. Our, our hearts ought to overflow with joy when we see somebody come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. So, be, so to be concerned about the loss is a part of our revival heart. There's no nonsense in forgiving. See, that's part of revival too. Matthew 18, 35 says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts... Forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Forgive. That's hard to do. Somebody hurts you. Oh, man. It takes forever to forgive, doesn't it? But that's part of revival. How quickly can you forgive? How quickly can you go on? How quickly can you get back to your normal life after somebody's hurt you? Well, it's not easy, is it? But revival tells us forgive. Now, it does not say forget. And it would be a good thing if you could. But I've never known anybody yet who could forget. But we leave those things behind. You don't bring them up every day and remember them so you can worry about them or be angry with them. You forgive and you put it in the back, in the past. There's no nonsense in preventing divisions. Did you know that certain people in certain churches, they like to cause divisions? Because they like to talk and they like to have their way and they like to have their opinion and, you know, I'm just going to do this until it's my way. Well, 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Now, that doesn't mean we have to agree on every little point. What it means is there is, a, there is a faith, a basic faith, that we in a body of Christ, the local church, need to agree upon. And we ought not to be in disagreement. We ought to keep those basic things together. And that's part of revival. And then, you're not going to like this one, or maybe you will. There's no nonsense in giving. That's part of revival too. 
2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly. How did, that, how did that feel this morning or yesterday when you picked up your checkbook and you wrote a tithe for two weeks? Wow. <laughs> did you hesitate? You say, well, I wasn't there, so do I have to give my tithe? Did you think about that? Revival says, not grudgingly, or of necessity, I've got to do this. I don't want to, but I have to do this. For God loveth a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. And uh, some of us who, who know a little bit about the scriptures and a little Greek, they tell us that means hilarious. <laughs> I get to give another time to the Lord. How about that? Isn't that wonderful? Hey, folks, that's revival. Now, when we get there, we are revived. Because I have a feeling that when you get there, all these other things are going to fall in place, don't you? Because giving is a hard thing for a lot of people. And then there's a natural concern. I want to talk about that. It's natural for us to be concerned about who God is. That's natural. Because the Bible says in Romans 1 that it was made manifest and that God has showed it unto us. And that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen and that we are without excuse. It's natural to know something about God. Now it may not be Jehovah. It really is, but people may call a different name, a spirit or, a, or an other life or a transcendental type thing, whatever they want to call it. They're, they're, but they know that there's something besides this life. Because that's a natural concern. Everybody has that. It's natural for us to con be concerned about death. Everybody is concerned about death because everybody's going to die. You know, a person either has or they will. And it's not something you can practice to see if you like it. You know, like marriage, people say, I'm going to get married and see if I like it. If I don't, I'll just get unmarried. Well, you can't do death that way because, you know, <laughs> you can't practice death. You don't know what it's like. That's why it's so uncertain. And so we have a, a natural concern about death. Is it the end of everything? Is death a door or, or some uncertain realm? Uh, is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Is God out there somewhere? How long is life after death? All these questions come. That's a natural concern. But to the believers, all these questions have easy answers. We, all, we already know the answers to all, all of these, you see. But what about the death of a believer? What about your death? Well, number one, the Bible says in Psalm 23, that though I walk through the shadow of valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And then we notice in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19 that life is to be chosen among believers. We choose life. Um, I believe in the doctrines of grace and I believe God does what he wants to do and all. But I believe that you and I, God tells us we can choose life. He told them in Deuteronomy, he said, choose life. Don't give up on life. Keep living. Because God gave that to you as a gift. Don't give up on it. Because he, you don't know what is yet to come. You know, young people, I know how it is, and all of us know who are older, we know how it is to grow up from a child. But you know, you, you go from zero to 18 years old, and you think, boy, life is really bad. You know, life is really bad. But then when you get out on your own, you realize, you know, if it's bad, it's my fault. I did it. Or I didn't do it. Or, you know, here I am. I'm a grown-up person. I pretty well do what I want. I can drive my car. I can paint my house. I can go where I want to, do what I want to, you know, and then you've got the rest of your life to do that. So choose life. Don't choose death. Choose life. And live life. That's a natural concern. But you know, the Bible says in Matthew 10, 39, he that findeth his life, uh, he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life, for my sake, shall find it. So in choosing life, make sure you choose a life in Christ. Choose a life that will honor Christ. Choose a life that includes Christ in every day's activities. Don't just say, I'm a Christian, and then a month later say, I'm a Christian, or I'm a believer, or I'm going to heaven when I die. No, make Christ a part of your life every single day, one way or another. And if you have to put something on your mirror to remind you, do that. Whatever you have to do. Paul told the Galatians, he said, I'm in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 20, he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live 
by the faith of the Son of God. And then there's one more, and I'll do it quickly. That is the necessary concern. You remember Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9? He says, I said, I will not make mention of him. I'm just going to quit talking about God. I'm just going to stop. Causes too much trouble, too many things going on. I'm just going to stop. The Bible says, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay, which means I could not stop. Uh, yesterday I went down to my son's house. And his wife offered me a cup of decaf coffee. I bought some instant decaf to keep at their house so that when I, because my, my son drinks regular coffee like my other son. They drink the pots at a time, not cups at a time. And so I go down there at 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't want ca uh, caffeine because I won't sleep. And so I keep this down. So what she did, she heated up this uh, big cup of water in the microwave. I didn't know how she heated it up. She brought it in there and, and she said, oh, it's a little hot. It's been boiling. I said, okay. And I don't know, those of you who use microwaves, you probably know what happened. I didn't think. I just opened that little thing and I poured that in there and it went, just about ran over the top. You see. And uh, so it, it just bubbled over. And I'm thinking, man, <laughs> you know, I, I got I to drink it. It took a long time to get it all stirred up and everything, you know, like that. And so I, it, it just, I didn't think it was ever going to stop going up, up, up. In fact, I thought it was dark colored beer at first. Was, you know, how it does. And I didn't want to have anything to do with that. And uh, so it, it's, the word stay means to stop. It won't stop. And so inside our bones, if we stop witnessing for the Lord, if we stop talking about the Lord and teaching the young people about the Lord and talking to our neighbor kids and our neighbors about the Lord and talking to our work, co-workers about the Lord, if we do that, if we're really saved and have this necessary concern, there's no way we can. Somebody put a little fake thing on Facebook yesterday about on the 20th day of March, uh, uh, Facebook will not allow any more religious uh, sayings on Facebook. And I thought, well... How can they do that? That's impossible. Because about half of what you say has a religious connotation to it. So they just have to close Facebook. But we, we can't help it. We have to say something, don't we? We have to tell somebody. If we know the Lord, we have to tell them. So that's one part of the necessary concern. In 1 Corinthians 9.16, Paul said, Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is me. I have to preach the gospel. What about if they put you in prison? I'll still preach the gospel. What are you going to do when they put you down in a pit? Well, I'm going to get with Silas and we're going to sing a few hymns and we're going to preach the gospel. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're going to do. It's necessary. We have to. And you know, if you don't have that, you need revival. That's what revival is. I'm not talking about doing more. I'm not talking about going to church more. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about revival. Philippians 2.15 says that you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation whom among, uh, among whom you shine as lights in the world. If you're, not light, if you're not shining as a light, you need revival. And then I just want to conclude because i got several other things here that I'm not going to mention. I just want to ask, are you really concerned about revival? And again, I don't do this a lot because I, I don't want to sound like I'm blaming you for anything. I don't want to sound like that I'm better than you. I don't want to sound like that I'm up here and you're down there because I, you know I don't believe that. You know I need this as much as you do. But I just want to say, are we really concerned about revival? About how, how much more we can enjoy our life with the Lord? Isaiah 34, 16 says, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. That's God's book. This is God's book. Don't read this just like a novel. It's not a novel. It's God's book. It's not a science book. It's God's book. It's not a math book. It's God's book. It isn't a philosophy book. It's God's book. And it's the only one that God has written. It's God's book. Seek ye out of the book, the Lord, and read. And Isaiah 55, 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is, is near. Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Amos 5, 4 says, Thus, thus saith the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. 
Seek the Lord. Everywhere you go, seek the Lord. Is the Lord in this opportunity? Is the Lord in this activity? Is the Lord in this decision? Is the Lord a part of this? Is the Lord a part of that? That's revival. It's not just doing more and being more and dressing different and acting different. No, it's what we are inside because the Lord has helped us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. But listen to Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Get self out of the way. Oh, that's hard to do. We're all proud. We all love ourselves. We all want what we want. But get that out of the way. Deny yourself. And then James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and you shall, he shall lift you up. That's revival. I think that probably should have been the text. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. I don't know what you need today, but I pray the Lord's touched you with this message, and I pray that he'll touch all of us, that we may become more like him and fulfill the righteousness that he's given us in our lives. Let's stand for prayer.